Welcome to Hamilton Works. I'm your host, Al Lutchen. And we're going to be talking about two really important topics today. One of them is the impact of agriculture on the greater Hamilton community and, of course, right across the country. And then we're going to be talking about job search tips in the latter part of the show with uh, Fred Hopkinson from Career Compass Canada. And with us right now is Carl Lowith, who is the uh, part of the Joe Lowith and Sons Limited Dairy Farm uh, here in Hamilton, and Mr. Roy Schuker who has his own farm called Vine Ridge Farms Limited and is also the president of the Hamilton Wentworth Federation of Agriculture. Thank you gentlemen for your time to come in. Nice to be here. Let's talk about the impact uh, of agriculture in the community, Carl, in terms of economic impact. Well, the economists tell us that uh, agriculture in the Hamilton uh, Wentworth, uh, or the city of Hamilton, is a $1.3 billion industry. We have a wide diversity of uh, farms, uh, highly sophisticated, uh, using the latest in technology, marketing throughout North America and in many cases uh, throughout the world. The rural area in Hamilton encompasses over 65% of, uh, of the city of Hamilton, so it's a, it's a dramatic impact. Roy, uh, relative to the impact, w tell us a little bit about the range of farms that, uh, that we have here in Hamilton, because we're sort of unique in that area. Well, we have many, many different types of farms. Uh, uh, Carl is involved with the dairy industry. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, grain and oil seeds grown in the area. Uh, I think we're very fortunate to have a, a port here in, in the city of Hamilton that can, uh, and, and some companies that can ship uh, our grains uh, all over the world. And uh, they do ship a lot. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, uh, veg fruit and vegetable growers. We have flowers and, and uh, nursery stock, uh, poultry. I, I know that uh, the hog uh, industry has been going down the last few years, uh, but uh, it's truly diverse uh, types of agriculture. And Carl, uh, farming today isn't, isn't like the, it used to be 10 years ago. A lot of technology now, very modern. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, uh, that's right. Uh, like every other industry, agriculture has embraced technology. On our own farm, we work with pedometers. Every cow has a pedometer. When she comes to be milked, we uh, take a reading. It gives us, uh, identifies the cow, tells us uh, what her production is, tells us her activity, which can be an indication of uh, A, she could be in heat or B, not feeling good. It measures the conductivity of the milk, which can give us an indication if there's a problem, an infection in the udder. It gives us a whole range of, uh, of information when you deal with large numbers that become very important. We also work uh, with some breeding stock. We buy frozen semen from around the world. A lot of that is genomically tested, so we have an idea before any of the bull's daughters hit the ground what those uh, daughters might be like. A lot of the seed we buy is genetically modified seed, which uh, makes it uh, resistant to uh, what's coming down the pipe now, and especially important in a year like this, it can be resistant to diseases, to some insects, but also can be drought resistant in, in many cases. Some of the field uh, equipment is uh, GPS monitored. Uh, people are using GPS when they're combining or spraying so they're not missing anything, they're not overlapping. We're getting yields on the go. At the end of the day we get a yield map indicating high and low spots in the, in, in the, the field. Our neighbor has just recently installed a robotic milker. So this is a machine, uh, he milks 50, 60 cows. This machine works 24 hours a day, individually milking cows as they, as they come to it, and he's getting a lot of the information that, I, uh, that we are also getting with our pedometers. But uh, it certainly, uh, agriculture has embraced technology. Yeah, it's a high-tech world for sure. High-tech world, and, and it's making us extremely efficient out there. Roy, let's talk about some of the challenges facing farming, everything from the administrative pieces, the, you know, the red tape, uh, Mother Nature we can't do much about, but let's talk a little bit about the uh, importation and, and uh, products coming inbound. Yes, uh, we, uh, we have to compete with countries that uh, have a lower standard than, than we have for our own, our own products. Uh, we, they have uh, uh, cheaper labor. They have uh, less regulations of the sprays and, 
and uh, things they can use on their, their fruit and vegetables. Uh, they can uh, send them here uh, and, and undercut the, the prices that uh, it costs our, our farmers to produce. We should talk a little bit about the quality uh, of our product here in Ontario uh, as compared to sort of offshore. I, I don't know about what the inspections are like with the food inbound, but let's just talk a little bit about that. Well, I don't know that their quality is less, but I don't know whether, they're, whether the inspection uh, is, it guarantees that it is. Uh, they, uh, uh, we have to have ours certainly up to, up to uh, qual uh, qualifications, and, and I hope that theirs are, are up to it too. And Carl, you were saying sort of as a dairy farmer, you, you're like every load that goes out is, is tested. That, that's right. Uh, they take a sample of every load before they put it on the truck and uh, they test them uh, regularly. They do a, uh, a spot check on the truck before it's unloaded at the dairy and if there's any problem that on, the, on that load, they can go back to the individual farmers that contributed it and identify very quickly any, any issues. So, Roy, how, how can Ontario uh, uh, folks, you know, support uh, local farmers. Is, is there any sort of uh, branding of the products in stores that they can look for so they know they're, they're buying an uh, Ontario product? Well, there's the Foodland Ontario logo that uh, uh, appears on the Ontario fruit. Uh, I think most supermarkets will say product of Ontario, product of Canada, or product of Chile, or wherever, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, we will buy the local produce over over imported produce. Uh, uh, there are the farmers markets too. Uh, it's uh, it's not a big section of our economy, but uh, uh, it's a good way to get locally grown fresh product. The product is picked is picked from the tree when it's fresh, and not picked green and shipped thousands of miles. Uh, it has to be picked green that so that it can stand the travel and and then ripened and it doesn't have the taste or the quality of, of tree ripened fruit that we get here in Ontario. And Carl, you were saying there's also a, a logo, I think, on, on milk products? Yes, that's right, a little blue cow logo which guarantees consumers uh, that it's 100% Canadian milk used in that product. So uh, it's, it's a good symbol to be looking for. Now the farmers uh, also have to deal with uh, red tape like everybody else and regulation. How much of a challenge is that today, Roy? It's quite a challenge, not only uh, with federal regulations and provincial regulations, but now with the amalgamated city uh, that we all fall under. Uh, the, a lot of uh, regulations uh, are city-oriented regulations that are trying to put them onto uh, farm operations and it doesn't work sometimes. So that's got to complicate life, Carl? Yes, it, it, it does a little bit, uh, especially for farms that are within the city of Hamilton that are trying to expand where uh, I think it's important that people realize what we talked about, the economic impact of agriculture and uh, how we should work to help them, uh, farmers out there that are want, willing to expand either livestock or other operations when it comes to minimum distance separations and uh, neighborhood issues, uh, that sort of thing. I was just in uh, Tavistock a couple of days ago talking to a developer there and uh, that's a very rural community in the deeds of the lots that they're selling, they're stipulating that this is a rural community and you're going to be subject to the sights and sounds and smells of an agricultural community. So they have, that's how they have addressed that subject. Uh, I'm not sure that we're quite at that stage, but it's probably something we should be at here in the city of Hamilton. And you, you both sat on the uh, local agricultural uh, committee as well, which I th think I would, is a pretty important vehicle for uh, as yes. a forum to discuss all this, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it was. Uh, it was developed when, when we amalgamated to uh, sort of advise the, the city councillors uh, on, on the concerns that we have in the agricultural community and uh, uh, they, a lot of them aren't aware of that and, uh, and we've presented many, many cases to them and we've uh, helped develop the uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, rural policy. We were talking about Mother Nature. Uh, certainly, this year has been a very dry year. What can cons consumers expect over the next uh, 12 months relative to pricing? Well, uh, I'm sure the price will go up. I think I heard that uh, Tim Hortons was already raising the price of donuts because they thought that the price of flour might go up. Uh, how much does flour do they use in a donut? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> 
But anyway, uh, also uh, our beef farmers are short of hay. They're going to have to sell off some of their cows and that uh, makes the, uh, the calf crop for next year smaller. So then the price will go up because uh, because there's there'll be fewer fewer beef animals to kill and that and hogs have been the herds have been been uh, cut back and uh, they also will experience the same problem with shortage in the, in, the, uh, in maybe a year. And that's one thing we can't control is weather, is it? Carl? That's right. And uh, probably more importantly, it's what happens in the American Midwest and in those huge crop growing areas. Uh, because really the Ontario picture and, and specifically the Hamilton picture doesn't mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. But we're seeing in, in our case, uh, two or three months ago, we were buying soybean oil meal, which is a major feed component for us, for $400 a ton. It's now 650 a ton, and we use uh, we use a lot of it. And all livestock producers would be in a similar situation. So it, it's going to have a dramatic impact impact going down the road. Yeah, so it has like a cascading That's effect exactly right. across That's the whole right. industry. Yeah. And we were talking also uh, just before we started the show about the importance of agriculture to generating jobs. Carl, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I had the uh, I was fortunate enough to hear uh, a gentleman speak the other day from the uh, Canadian Seed Growers Association. He's also the vice president of a big seed company. And he was uh, uh, complaining about the lack of qualified uh, students coming through the pipeline relating to agriculture. And he said, when you talk to students about agriculture or people that are looking for careers, uh, they think you're talking about farming and, and they kind of dismiss it. A, they don't want to be a farmer. B, they don't have the opportunity. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about agriculture jobs as they relate to marketing, engineering, technology, advertising, research. And he said there's tremendous opportunities out there for students who are willing to go down that, uh, that route and are interested in that. So there's a strong message there, isn't, isn't there, Roy, for especially young people going mm -hmm. through college right. to take a look at this industry. Right. And, and there is uh, like a shortage of labor or people that don't want to work on a farm. So that's why you see the, the situations like Carl was talking about where they put in a, in a, in a robot milker that uh, they don't have to hire somebody to do the milking, so the machine does it. And it's the same as industry that, that robots can do a number of these jobs and it's uh, it takes the place of labor. Yeah, now we were talking uh, a little bit about the sort of the, the, the freshness and quality of food. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of from farm to table, uh, which ties into that to that strategy. Roy, do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of that importance uh, and that freshness that, that uh, consumers should take a look at? Yes, uh, they, like we, we mentioned, the, the, the Ontario logo, the, the uh, Foodland Ontario logo, that is uh, locally grown food. It's going to be fresher. Uh, you can go to the farmers markets. There's 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 I var there's various about, ones around. I think there's about seven in in the Hamilton area. Right. And uh, you can pick up uh, things that were pulled out of the ground in you know a few hours ago or picked off the tree uh, a couple hours ago, and they're they're fresh. They're ripened on the tree, and and they taste. They have taste. They they. Uh, uh, are great, greater than something that's been sitting on a truck for a couple of days. Look, looking down the road, uh, Carl, you know, in your uh, sort of into the future, if you like, um, how hard is it going to be to attract new generation farmers uh, to do that heavy lifting that you both do in your major farms? Well, um First of all, we don't do a lot of heavy lifting anymore. Okay. We're up along a, a lot of hours, but I, I, it seems to be I, I used to work a lot harder when I was a kid that, I've, that I'm doing today, slugging okay. bales and, yeah. and that sort of thing. <laughs> and I guess my feeling on the, on the subject is if you run a profitable business, that's what it takes to attract uh, the next generation into it. Uh, the idea that this is a lifestyle but you're not going to make much money, it's not going to cut it for them and I, and I don't blame it blame them, but uh, profitability is, going, is the key. Uh, you have to make money at it and uh, it makes it easier to transfer from one generation to uh, the next a profitable business. If there's no money there to, to buy out the, the previous generation, it's not going to happen. So uh, I think that's the key. Yeah, so it's like, it's like everything else. Uh, farming today is big business. Uh, it has to be run like a business and so the next generation 
of farmers are going to probably be the MBA crowd, if you like. Well, that's, <laughs> that's quite possible. They need a lot of uh, people skills, a lot of business skills, uh, that sort of thing. And we talk about the, the, the local farming uh, situation, and they've done a great job, and they produce a great product. But uh, the, the farmers that are in the Hamilton area are big on the national and international scene. Uh, my neighbors sending frozen embryos uh, literally around the world. I have a hay dealer up the road from me that ships hay down into uh, Florida to the horse market uh, down there. There's a nursery grower that's all over the eastern seaboard, and a bro broccoli grower doing uh, the same. So. I think many urban uh, people see the, the farmers at the market and, and kind of associate this, this close association and, and the farms are, are marketing within a few miles of where it's being grown, but uh, uh, that's one part of it. The other part of it is they're, they're active on the international scene as on, well. On the export market. Yes. So, uh, yeah. And I think that's a great point because we probably don't, we, well, we never see that. I didn't even no. realize that myself, right. so that's interesting. Uh, so w when your when your federation gets together uh, at your meetings, Roy, what what sort of your your top agenda items these days? Well, uh, right now there's there's the hay situation. They're, we're dealing with the uh, the West is just talking about sending hay to Ontario this this year uh, because uh, a few years ago they had a, a drought out there and we sent hay out to them, so they're returning the favor this year. Uh, I guess uh, uh, one of the things that concerns us is the species at risk legislation that's coming out that uh, they put more emphasis on, on saving a bobolink in the field of hay than, than, than the farmer's right to cut that at the proper time to, to have the best feed for his cows. They, uh, we also have an issue with the SPCA and some of the hard-nosed uh, regulations that they have come in enforcing uh, and, the, and the entitle, entitlement that they've been given. Uh, so there's lots of challenges. There is. So that, that's, uh, and that's something that probably keeps you up at night a little bit too, <laughs> eh? <laughs> so I'll just give you the last word to you, Carl, just in terms of uh, wrapping up with the impact of uh, farming. Uh, what kind of message do you want to leave to the, to the consumers here? Well, I think to the consumers and uh, the people that are in the decision-making uh, process, uh, farmers, uh, I always get the impression they're flying below the radar. They're, they're out there doing their thing, but what they're doing is, is big. Uh, it is big. And when they make money, farmers are notorious for spending money. When they, when they make money, they'll spend it. They'll expand, they'll buy new equipment, they'll hire more people. Uh, that just seems to be the nature. So it's in everyone's best interest uh, to, to keep that in, in mind and to, to work with the agricultural community, I feel. Thank you very much. Carl Loweth, Roy Shuker, thank you so much for coming in and all the best to both of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hamilton Works will return right after this. Welcome back to Hamilton Works. I'm your host, Al Lutchen, and with me is Fred Hopkinson, Executive Vice President for Career Compass Canada. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Al. Good pleasure to be here. Fred, let's talk a little bit about the importance of job search and how the digital world has changed all that and, and the need to have uh, a digital footprint today, I think, is the new jargon. Uh, we used to just uh, be dealing with resumes and, and interview techniques, and now it's a whole other new strategy. Well, that's certainly the buzzword, Al, and uh, that's where society is going these days. Uh, I was just talking to one of my candidates this afternoon and uh, telling him how uh, I managed to lose my job at one point because of a merger. I left there on a Friday, and I had my new job on Monday, and I did that by knocking on doors. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. The social media is has grown to such an extent that if you're not a part of it, uh, you're a loser right at the outset. And so I guess LinkedIn is a big big part of that, Fred? Well, LinkedIn is a very big part of it. LinkedIn has become the uh, Facebook for professionals. And uh, it's so it's where most of the professional people go. Uh, but that's not to discount Facebook. I mean, Facebook has now over a million, over a billion, I'm sorry, over a billion members uh, where uh, 
uh, LinkedIn has uh, something like uh, 175 million. I mean, still incredible numbers, incredible numbers. So when people are, are preparing their, their resumes, they need to look at that digital footprint and, uh, and have it really uh, tightened up and looking really good. Well, I think you have, to, you have to plan as much in advance as it's possible to do. And I think you've heard the old saying, there's no such thing as job security anymore. Uh, and so you have to be much more career resilient. And that means you have to be looking at you know, your plan, where you're going, and measuring yourself against your plan on an ongoing basis. And that's something that people have a difficult time of comprehending, uh, but certainly you know you can um, uh, use the social media and the social networks to improve your position long before you ever start to actively search for a job. And some people may be sort of concerned with having their profile up on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, be worried about their employer may wonder whether you know they're thinking about leaving. What, what's uh, sort of the the positioning on that? Well, it depends on how you want to position. If that's a concern, and it could be a very real concern, you don't want to tip your hand if you're you know if you're looking for some for something else. Uh, but using uh, Facebook, for instance, you can use it in a slightly different way. Uh, the same thing with LinkedIn. Uh, it's a lot of. Uh, you know, my friends are on there not because they're seeking employment, uh, simply because they want to be known. And uh, so it depends on how you want to present yourself. Now, relative to doing resumes uh, today, uh, what, what do you recommend uh, for people who uh, might want to start to look for, for work uh, and wor look for a new position and do some more career management? What, what kind of, what's the sort of the, the hot resume uh, today that they should look at? <laughs> well, there are th there's really three different formats of resumes out there. And the traditional one and the one everyone's accustomed to seeing is what they call the uh, reverse chronological, where you list your employers and the responsibilities you had with those employers. Uh, there's a different format for those people that may be wanting to change careers and move from one occupation to another, move from an accounting position into a human resources position, for instance. And that's called a functional resume, and it, uh, it goes about a di little differently. It breaks your uh, experience and skills down into various functional levels, so it's easier to sell uh, to an employer when you're trying to make a change. But there's a third one, and that's kind of a hybrid that, uh, frankly, I prefer, and, and you know that, uh, that... Uh, presents information a little bit differently and uh, it's, uh, it, it's eye-catching, it uh, appeals to people, uh, but it's really in the construct of the summary statement that all three of those use in addition to the professional achievement statements that people are, are uh, using on the resumes. Now we were talking a little bit just before we got on camera here about sort of being job search ready and, and you touched on that a little bit. Uh, how important is that? Because that kind of ties to career management, right? Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, it's, it's kind of getting back to what I was saying earlier in terms of being career resilient. You know, you always want to know where it is you want to go and be preparing for that. If you have a, you know, if you have a target, uh, then you can be doing things like developing your resume, ensuring that you're covering all the bases, uh, getting involved in uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, getting the message out there um, through, those, through those media. Uh, so that you can uh, kind of keep the you know keep moving forward and be prepared uh, when you decide that the time is or it, if the decision is forced on you by someone else to now, to make the move. Now, certainly, uh, networking is still a, a big piece of job search, and maybe you can ad uh, you know address that. Well, networking is you know uh, where most people get jobs. Uh, the uh, major surveys that have been done in recent years show that better than 68 percent of people who get jobs get them through networking. And part of that networking now is obviously through the social media as well. So networking is where the action is. And, and that's what, uh, in my experience, most people have difficulty with. You know, the idea of talking to people that they don't know, uh, calling someone up uh, at the uh, referral of someone else, they find it very difficult. But you'll find in networking there are all kinds of people out there who not only are anxious, well, want to help, but they're anxious to help if, they, if they're approached the right way and they know you need help. Uh, so, you know, networking is, uh, is very, very productive. And there are still people who get jobs, probably 10 to 15 percent get jobs through uh, executive recruiters and a similar number through ads uh, in uh, newspapers and other media. But certainly uh, getting, uh, getting the early warning on that job possibility is, is important, isn't it? It's extremely important. Sure. But that's, again, you know, it, it's a constant state of preparation uh, because you never know what's going to happen 
uh, slide sh down the road. And that's, again, what people find difficult. You know, the concept has been, well, you know, uh, I work at, uh, at the FASCO because my father worked at the FASCO and his father before him, you know. Uh, that doesn't work anymore, as you well know. Yeah, so there's this constant sort of churn rate that's happening now in, in the employment uh, workforce. And do, do you recommend that, uh, you know, people should be uh, volunteering for organizations such, such as Rotary, which, of course, you, you've been a longtime member of, as part of that, that networking? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and again, it, you know, I'm kind of coming back. I know I keep coming back to the social media, but that's where it's really important. Um, you know, working, doing volunteer work uh, is going to get you exposure on some of those different uh, um, uh, social media sites. Uh, anything that gets on the internet is going to be there. Uh, so you can prepare yourself uh, through that kind of activity to you know, develop a, a brand, if you will, that's going to be uh, of extreme help to you down the line. Now, if somebody is out of work and, and they're watching our show, what, what would you say would be sort of the top priorities they should be doing right now? Well, I think the first thing they should be doing is looking at the resume. Uh, many people don't do that. It's typically, you know, when you put together a resume and when you change employers, you drop one and add another one. Uh, but you think you have to be looking at that on an ongoing basis. So that would be kind of step number one. Uh, and, and tied in with that, uh, you want to be doing some self-assessment, looking at your skills, particularly your transferable skills and your expertise, and, and determining what your job market is really going to be if you get to that point. And re relative to uh, people who are you know, in transition and, and looking when it comes to negotiating with an employer, um, do you recommend uh, negotiation or do they just accept uh, what they're given? Oh, at negotiation, absolutely. The problem with negotiation, most people have this perception that if they're made an offer uh, and they try to negotiate, the offer is going to disappear. The employer is going to pull it off the table. And it's highly unlikely that's going to happen. You know? So uh, it, typically in, a, in that kind of a scenario, if you, uh, once you have an offer, if you determine what are the real uh, breaking points in it, uh, try to narrow down the issues to one or two maximum and then go back on that basis. So it's, you know, this is a great offer, get everything in there, the only problem is the money and if we can come up with another X thousand dollars we've got a deal. And so it's like a real estate counter offer, you make it really simple. Right? And you know, if you do that, uh, the typical response you're going to be is one of three. You know, uh, okay fine, that's great Al, we'll, we'll give you an extra five thousand dollars. Or, well we can't do that but Suppose we split the difference on it. The worst you're going to get is, I'm sorry, Al, but that's all we have in the, in the kitty. So then Al has to decide at that point in time whether he's prepared to work for that money or not. But taking the offer off the cable just doesn't happen unless you go back and say, I need more money, I need more uh, pension, I need more benefits, I need more vacation time. Then it's going to be obvious that you're just not going to get anywhere. And at that point, uh, the, the employer will, uh, will shut it down. So it's just about having good, good common sense and good judgment. Good common sense and judgment, knowing your, you know, knowing your, uh, your, your skills and your abilities in the marketplace. That's great. Well, Fred, thanks very much for coming in and talk, talking about job search. We appreciate that. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Al. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been watching Hamilton Works on Cable 14. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Al Lachin.